this is the season of Lent, and during Lent, uh, priests go to multiple churches in order to hear confessions in the different parishes. And in many of the churches, they have what are called penance services. And when you go to those penance services, why are they called penance services? Because you come and you receive your penance. Because it used to be known as the sacrament of penance. Today, we don't just call it the sacrament of penance, but we also call it the sacrament of reconciliation, because you're reconciling yourself to God, and not just to God, but to the community. Because when you sin, you're not just affecting your relationship with God, but you're, you're affecting your relationship with your community. And let me tell you, in all of these penance services that I have attended, the gospel reading that is read is the prodigal son, which is a very famous story, we're all familiar with it. Uh, and it's always read, and not just that, when I enter the confessionals in the different churches, I'm always met with that famous painting of the prodigal son being welcomed and embraced by his father. And so I thought, uh, let me put a little different spin than the one that I have been hearing, if I can call it that, in all of these uh, penance services on the gospel the prodigal son gospel, which is found in uh, Luke chapter 15. So before we begin the reading of the gospel, let's uh, enter into a spirit of prayer this morning, reminding ourselves that we are in the presence of God in a very special way. That the Lord is here with us. Allow that spirit to come into our hearts, fill us with peace this day, and now let's listen to the reading of the prodigal son gospel. Jesus went on to say, there was was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the property now. Give me my share of my inheritance now. So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. He went to a faraway country where he wasted his money in a life of debauchery, in a reckless life. He spent everything he had on prostitutes. Then a severe famine spread over that country and he was left with nothing. So he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods the pigs ate, but no one would give him any. At last, he came to his senses and said to himself, 
Now all of my father's hired workers have more than they can eat. And here I am, starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. So he got up and started back to his father. Now, he was still a long way from home when his father saw him. And his father's heart was filled with pity. And so the father ran threw his arms and his cloak around his son and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called to his servants, Quickly, hurry, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Then go and get the prize calf and kill it. And let us celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the feasting began. In the meantime, the older son was out in the field. On his way back, when he came close to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on here? The servant said, Your brother has come back home, and your father has killed the prized calf because he got him back safe and sound. Now the older brother was so angry that he would not go into the house. So his father came out and begged him to come in. But he talked back to his father and said, Look, all these years I have worked for you like a slave, and I've never disobeyed your orders. And what have you given me in return? Not even a goat for me to have a feast with my friends. But this son of yours wasted all your property on prostitutes. And when he comes back home, you kill the prized calf for him? The father answered the older son, My son, you are always here with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be happy because your brother was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. This is a story about a father who loved his two children and who wished for them to love each other as well. This story is one Jesus tells in a series of three stories to the Pharisees 
about the nature of God after they take Jesus to task for eating with sinners. Chapter 15 begins with the lost sheep. One day, when many tax collectors and other outcasts came to listen to Jesus, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law started grumbling. This man welcomes outcasts and even eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. What would you do? You leave the other ninety-nine sheep in the pasture and go looking for the one that God lost until you find it. When you find it, you are so happy that you put it on your shoulders and carry it back home. Then you call your friends and neighbors together and say to them, I am so happy I found my lost sheep. Let us celebrate. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman who has ten silver coins loses one of them. What does she do? She lights a lamp, sweeps her house, and looks carefully everywhere until she finds it. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says to them, I am so happy! I found the coin I lost! Let us celebrate! <coughs> in the meantime, and in the same way, I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. So, Jesus tells us about the shepherd who leaves his 99 sheep behind and goes in search of the lost one. Jesus tells us about the story of a woman who turned her house upside down looking for the one lost coin. He is addressing the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were grumbling that Jesus would dare to eat or associate himself with sinners. And finally, we have this story where Jesus tells them the tale of a father who had two sons and about how compassionate this father is and the graciousness with which he deals with his two sons. What is our problem? Our problem is the same of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. We have a problem imagining a God who is generous. Because of our own jealousy and envy and because we do not think as God does, but we think as human beings do. Jesus asks in the Bible, Are you envious because I am generous, says the Lord our God? Why are you envious of people going to communion when so many in the church point fingers at people and say, this or this person should not be receiving communion. Father, don't you know? She should not be going to communion. She lives with her boyfriend. Yeah, she lives with her boyfriend and father. They, they're doing things. What do you mean they're doing things, I say? I get this all the time. It's the modern day Pharisees and, and teachers of the law who are grumbling of God's generosity. Well, what do you mean they're doing stuff? Well, 
they're doing stuff. Well, what do you mean they're doing stuff? Father, they're sleeping together. How, how do you know they're sleeping together? Oh, come on, Father. No, really, how do you know? Do you serve as a pillow in their bedroom? They could be living like brother and sister. Why are you judging people? Why are you passing judgment? Why, and and the, other, the bigger problem, other than judgment, is why are you envious of God's generosity? Rather than celebrating that these people are going to communion, because you don't know. Maybe they approach the priest, and the church does permit that. Maybe they approach the priest, and they're living like brother and sister. But at the end, it's none of your business. When you go to communion, you don't say, well, maybe you do. Lord, well, what do we say? We say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But maybe you say, Lord, my neighbor's not worthy that you should enter under his roof. Is that what you say? Or you say, I'm not worthy. Because none of us is worthy. None of us. We are all sinners. Each and every one of us. You think your sin hurts God any less than the person next to you? Every single sin hurts God. Every sin. Our problem is that we try to understand God with our own limited human intellectual capabilities. And God is beyond our abilities to comprehend. God is the great unknown. The reason why we cannot imagine a God who forgives everything and anything is because we are not forgiving people who forgive and forget as God does. God does not have a memory like we do, where we dwell on and remember what people did to us and how they hurt and betrayed us. God forgets. You don't. That's why you have to keep praying that you do. May I have the mind of Jesus to be our prayer. Give me more grace, Lord, that I may have your heart. Take away my heart of stone and give me that heart of yours which is made for love alone. How many people, particularly during these penance services, I meet who worship their sins. They worship their sins. Meaning, they have made an idol out of their sins. They focus on everything that they have done. If you focus on the fact, for example, that you had an abortion, you've already confessed it, but you focus on that, and you keep replaying the cassette, that abortion is your idol. That abortion is your God. Not the God that we proclaim in these readings. The God who Pope Francis tells us is mercy. When you focus on the fact that you may have gotten a divorce, or that you may have cheated on your husband, or that you may not have been the best parent, or the best wife, or all the mistakes that you've made in the past that you have already been forgiven for, you worship those sins. Those sins are your God, not the God that we have just heard about here. We are to worship the Lord our God, and Him alone shall we serve. We focus on the moment of mercy, not on all the stuff that we have done. God has forgotten everything you've done. When you confess your sins, your soul is once again like this. Before, it's marked like this paper. Then you go and you confess your sins, and your, your soul becomes like this, white as snow. That's what we focus on. Jesus is addressing the concern that the Pharisees had that he's keeping company with sinners. The three stories all tell of a God who is too busy rejoicing over 
lost sheep, found coins, and found children to worry about what they did while they were lost. See, you worry about what you did while you were lost. And you worry about everything that, you know, the people in your life did while they were lost. God doesn't worry like that. He's too busy rejoicing that you've come back. And it's like the people who get married and then they ask their spouse, who may, let's say, you know, you're 40 years old when you get married to someone. You're 40. That means you've had a past for the last 40 years. Why are you asking them all the stuff that they did? How many boyfriends you had, how, you know, all this stuff. Why? What does it matter to you? Or like the husband who takes back his wife after she cheated on him, and he wants to probe and ask her, where did you sleep with the guy? How was it, you know, and all that stuff. Uh-huh. Why? You got her back. You should be rejoicing that you got her back or that you got him back. Why do you need to know the past? That's how God is. God is too busy celebrating and partying that he got you back. What about your kids? You know, why are you all so concerned about all that they did? Rejoice that they're here with you now. So how do you deal with the people in your life who have gone astray? Are you gentle? Do you forgive and forget? Or do you hold on to grudges? You hold on to grudges? Reliving the past and dwelling on what someone did to you? The Bible says all people have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners in need of God's mercy. And if we expect God to forgive us and forget what we have done, then why are we not willing to offer the same merciful forgiveness and forgetfulness to those around us? And I think the best illustration of this is the story that I repeat over and over again of Clara Bart, who had her husband cheat on her with her best friend. That happens. Oh yeah, it's very common, very common. And after a while, Clara Barton took back her husband. She didn't just take back her husband, but she began to be friends again with her best friend. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. And all the people, you know, all the all the righteous people, excuse me, all of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The Bible here says, verse 2 of chapter 15, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law started grumbling. This man welcomes outcasts and even eats with them. And Clara Barton says she'd be seen in uh, London in different cafes with her bestie, you know, that cheated, that slept with her husband. And what did the, all, and she says, and all the people around started grumbling. Uh, and they would say, same thing that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to Jesus. Clara, don't you remember what she did to you? Don't you remember? And Clara Barton said, no, I don't remember what she did to me. But I remember the moment in which I decided to forgive her. I remember the moment I decided to forgive her. That's what God does with us. God remembers the moment when we come to Him, opened our heart, opened our soul, and said, Here, here's what I've done. I'm sorry. 
Your soul is clean, and God doesn't remember. So why do you? Huh? That's a big question. Why? Why do you? If you have been forgiven, the Bible says, then you are to turn around and offer that same forgiveness to all those around you. Our God is the loving Father. The one who comes out running to you to kiss you, embrace you, and forgive you before you can get a word out of your mouth. While this is great news, it is also disturbing news. Because forgiveness is one of those gifts of God that cuts both ways. Because forgiveness is forgiveness of sin, and sin is wrong. In order to be forgiven, someone has, have, has to have fallen short of the glory of God. That's called sin, the Bible says. This can be as simple as having failed to be kind to someone, or as complicated as having killed someone. But God forgives every sin. Anything can be forgiven. The Bible says all sins can be forgiven. All of your sins. The only sin that is not forgiven, according to the Bible, is the sin against the Holy Spirit. And what is that sin? The sin against the Holy Spirit is the sin when I don't believe in forgiveness. So if I don't believe that God can forgive me, how can I be forgiven? That's the only way you cannot be forgiven, is if you doubt the forgiving, the forgiving power of God. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. So whatever the crime, very few of us would deny the possibility of being forgiven, but most of us would insist on penance. Hence, prisons, penitentiaries, we call them. They used to be penitentiaries. Now they're horrible places where nobody gets help. Prisons don't help. I spent three years as a chaplain at Pelican Bay State Prison. Places don't help. In East L.A., a young man, 15, 16 years old, and I'm thinking of many cases right now, had a horrible life where he was abused at home, not just physically, but sexually and emotionally. And then he gets into a gang, begins to be exploited, selling drugs. And then that same young man is manipulated into killing for the game. And at 16 years old, the judge slams the gavel because he just has a public defender that has a caseload stacked up on his desk, doesn't have a lawyer, just a public defender that, you know, he's got like this 16 year old, he has so many cases. And so he doesn't get adequate representation. And at 16 years old, he's thrown into prison with adults. And there he is exploited even more and manipulated by the prison system so that he kills within the prison and then he ends up in Pelican Bay at 20 years old having killed multiple people and is now in prison for life. And all that is left for him in the shoe, the segregated housing unit, which is torture, it's torture. 23 hours a day being locked up in a in a cage, in solitary confinement. It's called the SHU, the Segregated Housing Unit. 
and all that you do is you think about how to kill yourself. That's the number one problem at Pelican Bay State Prison. How do I take my own life? Because it's inhumane to be locked up. And I know many people say, well, you know, they get three meals a day. They get medical service and dental care. <clears throat> Man does not live by bread alone, says the Bible. <clears throat> Man does not live by bread alone. The number one problem of our society is not stuff, not money, not food. Just look around us. You know, we're all so fat. What is it now, like 70% of us are obese in our society? We don't have a food problem or material problem or a housing problem. We have a solitary problem, a loneliness problem. There's a modern day philosopher that writes about that. It's called existential loneliness. That is our problem, as modern day men. <clears throat> and that problem can only be fixed by God, no one else. If it could be fixed by stuff, then Fidel Castro's son would not have killed himself about a month ago. If it could be fixed by stuff, you wouldn't have Hollywood people drowning in bathtubs on drugs and dreaming of the next plastic surgery. The lift, whatever it is that, you know, the real lift we need is a spiritual lift that can only happen from God. The Bible says only God makes man happy. Only God. No one else. Only God makes man happy. And I have witnessed this in prison. The only way these people in the segregated housing unit with a terrible past could get through the shoe would be if they got to know the love of the Lord Jesus and the merciful love of the Father that we have just heard about. And that's what frees them. At the same time, I met many guards there in that prison who were slaves. Slaves. You know the number one problem in Crescent City, where I was pastor for three years, they thought that when the prison was going to open, that it was going to bring a lot of crime with it because of the families that would visit the inmates. Well, most of the families would only make it, you know, once every couple of years. So there wasn't that many people who would come to visit, even though there were thousands of inmates. And most of those families, when they would come to visit, would behave very well because it would be very easy to lose your visiting privileges and you'd never get to visit your incarcerated loved one. But the crime rate in Crescent City, when the prison opened in 1988, went off the roof because of the corrections officers. The corrections officers and the rates of domestic violence people who were free didn't have chains on but they did have chains on I witnessed some terrible mistreatment of the inmates I witnessed some imprisoned people who work in that prison. 
One of the big problems I had was that I would visit the inmates. And my parish, St. Joseph, was made up in large part by the people who worked in the prison, the corrections officers. And they would complain. People who went to church every week. Father, how can you visit these people? They are animals. You don't know what they've done. They don't deserve to have you visit. I know what they've done. They're not people. Because they felt they were better. So they got to put on a uniform. All of us have shown, have fallen short of the glory of God. And that guard is no better than that inmate who's killed multiple people in the eyes of God. No one is better in the eyes of God than anyone else. We're all God's children, all of us. The person who's had an abortion is no better than you who've given birth to ten kids. That is the beauty of the faith presented to us in the Bible, a liberating faith. This is why so many of us say, insisting on penance, that I have forgiven, but you can't say that. I have forgiven, but, you know, so there's a lady who comes to me and says, Father, I have forgiven that SOB of my ex-husband, but let me tell you what he did. SOB stands son of a gun, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm giving you the literal here, translation, okay? But let me tell you what he did. Has she really forgiven him? No! She hasn't forgiven him. Unless you forgive, Jesus says, from the heart. Your brother, you will not be forgiven. From the heart, forgiveness flows from here. Not from here. Does God have a but in his offer of forgiveness for your transgressions? You have a but, because we are human beings. God's offer of forgiveness comes with no conditions. You are forgiven, period. God has no memory like you do, and God doesn't remember and call you to work on the same, and calls you to work on the same in your life here on earth, if you are to be a true follower of his ways, and not the ways of the world. There are no strings attached to God's forgiveness. To this human attitude, which is devoid of mercy, comes this story of instant forgiveness with no strings attached. The extravagant love of God both fulfills and violates our sense of what is right. Most of us are hurt by this story because we want revenge, payback. I have to make my husband who cheated on me pay for what he did. I forgive him, but my child that did this or that needs to do this or that. I forgive him for what he did, but I want nothing to do with that person. Here we have to talk about something today. The attitude present in our country, devoid of mercy, toward the 12 million people who came here illegally and broke the law. They need to go back to where they came from. 
Isn't that the attitude? We really do not forgive as God forgave unless we are willing to let go and accept the people who have hurt us as if what happened never happened. That's mercy. And that's how God treats you and teaches you to treat those around you. Now, when you understand mercy, you can see why our Holy Father, Pope Francis, insists that we do not have an attitude devoid of mercy when dealing with people who have broken the law. There are consequences, but mercy has to be at the forefront of our action. And when you understand that, then you can see why the church today is so active in trying to bring a remedy to the 12 million or so people who are here without papers. As a society, we have to look at. And the church teaches that there are consequences to our actions. So there have to be consequences, but mercy has to be at the forefront. This is not a political issue. It is an issue of mercy for us as Catholics. And don't be the person who says, well, you know, the reason why the Catholic Church uh, speaks about this issue is because the Catholic Church wants the illegal immigrants so that they can fill their pews. And that is a very cruel, cruel way of looking at this issue. You cannot do that. You have to look at it very objectively. Look at the person. I know lots and lots of people, you know that I, uh, we are right now in a church which is, I would say, 70 to 80 percent uh, Hispanic. And many of our people are here illegally. And we have to look at the person the person, when you get to know a person's story, then that moves you to mercy. We have to look at, 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 at the people behind the laws that would be enacted that affect them. And that's what the church is wanting of us, and particularly our Holy Father today, Pope Francis. At the same time, prison reform is something that we have to do as a nation. You can't lock people up like that. It's not, it's not in the ways of God, particularly not in the spirit of the United States of America. We are a merciful nation, a nation of mercy. A nation of goodness. Americans are known throughout the world for their great generosity. You know, and I, uh, I'm an immigrant to this country, and uh, when I was growing up in Poland, we heard about the great United States of America, how generous Americans were. You know, how terrible communism was and how wonderful the United States of America is. And so we have to uh, keep that at the forefront, that we are a nation of mercy, of goodness, of forgiveness, of generosity. So there are no strings attached in God's forgiveness. To this human attitude, devoid of mercy, we have this story. We have the younger son. When he asked 
for his father's inheritance. What was he asking? When do you get your inheritance? When your father dies. So what is he asking for? He's asking for his father's death. He says, I want you to die. Because when do you get your inheritance? When your parent dies. He's so hungry for the world that he wished his own father dead, literally. So the father who values his son's freedom more than his own security divides his livelihood and says goodbye to his younger son who then goes off and squanders everything until one day he came back to himself. Bible says he comes back to himself. He comes back to himself and in his head he designs a confession that would get him a roof over his head and food in his belly. He comes to live off of his brother's inheritance because he's already spent half of it. So now he's coming back to live on the other brother's money and stuff having spent his own in loose living. As soon as the father sees him coming, he kills his brother's patent cow, and the party is on. There are no extra steps between the younger son's coming home and the welcome home party. No heart to heart with the father. No extra chores. No go to your room for a week and Think of what you've done. Just a clean robe, fine ring, and a pair of new sandals. This father doesn't even wait for the older brother to come home to begin the party. The party is on right away. The older brother isn't incensed by his younger brother's return or even the father's forgiveness of him. He is incensed by the celebration. What does the older brother want? Penance! Penance! You gotta pay for what you've done. That's not the God we celebrate. Where is the moral instruction here in this kind of welcome, the older brother says. What about facing the consequences of your actions? What about reaping what you sow? Well now, you're, you're having a demonstration here and an explanation of mercy. And the name of God is mercy. What kind of world is this? where we reward sinners while the God-fearing religious folks like us are out in the field. It is to all these questions that God asks another question. Are you envious because I am generous? Why are you jealous of God's generosity? Stop trying to figure out who is in and who is out. You will be very surprised when you get to heaven and find out who's there. Religious people are notorious thinking that they are better than others because they keep the rules. They go to church, do what they are supposed to do. Religious people expect their reward for good behavior and punishment for bad behavior. Religious people look down on others who are not of the fold who are different and who believe and who they believe are doomed. That's not the attitude we are presented here in these stories from the Bible. You, you are religious because it's good for you, not because it makes, it makes you better than other people. It's because you want to be better. That's why you're religious. The self-righteous people say, I am saved and you are not. Isn't that the attitude in our country? In all of the uh, born-again, evangelical, right-wing churches? I'm saved. You're not. I'm going to heaven. You're going to hell. 
all those signs everywhere, you know. That's not our attitude. We are Catholics. We don't have that attitude. We don't have the attitude that you're saved and I'm not. So join me so you can be saved, like the Jehovah Witnesses. Only 144,000 are going to be saved. The rest of you are going to hell. Actually, they don't believe in hell. It just means you're going to be a nothing. You will disappear. I won't get here into the theology of the Jehovah Witnesses. But I always say to myself, well, if only 144,000 are going to go to heaven, why are you out getting more competition? More competition. So the father here has lost both of his sons, if you think about it. The younger one to recklessness and the older one to a more serious fate, to a life of angry self-righteousness that takes him so far away from his father that he might as well be feeding pigs in the country. He wants his father to love him as he deserves to be loved because he has stayed put and followed orders and done the right thing. He wants his father to love him for all that and he does love him, but not for any of that, any more than he loves his younger son for what he has done. He does not love either of his sons according to what they deserve. He just loves them. God just loves you. God just loves you. Because of who He is. God loves you because of who God is. Not because of who you are. Because you're a sinner. This attitude of, I deserve to be loved, we don't deserve anything. We don't deserve God's love because of our sinfulness, how terrible we are. But God loves us because of who God is. He loves them more because of who He is than because of who they are. And the elder brother cannot stand it. He cannot stand a love that transcends right and wrong. He cannot stand a love that throws homecoming parties for prodigal sinners and expects the hard-working, righteous, religious people to rejoice and party along. He cannot stand this, and so he chooses to stand outside, outside the Father's house and outside the Father's love. He refuses the invitation to come inside and join the party. What about you? Are you partying? Rejoicing in the Father's love for all His children? Are you going to stand outside or come inside and party along? Are you going to rejoice and be glad at others' fortunate fortune or bask in your envy? The choice to stand outside or come inside and join along in the celebration is yours. It's yours. I want to explain to all of you today, we will continue this explanation of uh, the prodigal son next week. There's a lot more that I want to say about it. But I want you to just focus for the next week on this gospel. And think about in your own life how God has welcomed you so many times and how He continues to welcome in spite of and despite of your own sinfulness and how you are called to welcome all of the sinners in your midst. As we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for today. In a special way, we thank you for this beautiful word that just shows us how much you love each and every one of us. How you rejoice, how you call us to a life of rejoicing, a life of joy with you in knowing that we have been forgiven. All of our sins wiped away. And then we want that for all those around us to experience your mercy and your love through our mercy and our love as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless all of you here, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.